Australia once faced an agricultural crisis so intense that 60 million acres of farmland became completely useless. We're talking about an area larger than Scotland, just gone. The prickly pear cactus had turned entire regions into impenetrable walls of spines. Farmers tried everything, fire, poison, mechanical crushers, even proposals to use military flamethrowers. Nothing worked. The cactus kept spreading at a rate of 1 million acres per year. Then scientists made a desperate gamble, betting on a biological control experiment that had never been attempted on such a scale. Stay close to find out why they built a monument to celebrate it. Australia's farmland was under siege, but this wasn't a war fought with armies or weather. It was with a plant introduced decades earlier for a harmless purpose. The prickly pear cactus had quietly been spreading across the countryside, turning fertile fields into to walls of spines. By the early 20th century, the invasion had reached crisis levels. 60 million acres of farmland rendered useless, an area larger than Scotland. Farmers tried everything, fire, poison, mechanical crushers, even proposals to use military flamethrowers. Nothing worked. The cactus kept spreading at a rate of 1 million acres per year. Then scientists made a desperate gamble with a solution no one had dared try before. Scientists had spent years researching, testing, and carefully breeding millions of moth eggs each one holding the potential to turn the tide against the prickly pear. Here's what actually happened when those eggs hatched. The Cactoblastus cactorum caterpillars didn't just nibble on the cactus, they worked as coordinated teams, breaking through the tough outer skin of the pads to get at the soft tissue inside. Think of it like they were tunneling through the plant's defenses. Once inside, they'd feast until they grew to about 25 millimeters in length, completely hollowing out the cactus pad in the process. Raymond Sanderson described it in The Scone Advocate in 1954. The caterpillars ate the insides out of the pear, leaving mere shells, and multiplied at a phenomenal rate. The scale of the operation was insane. At the Chinchilla Prickly Pear Experimental Station, they were distributing up to 14 million moth eggs every single day. Farmers would receive shipments with simple instructions, place them on your densest cactus patches, and wait. By 1933, the numbers told the story. But here's the thing, this miracle solution almost never happened. The path to releasing those millions of eggs was filled with failures, political pressure, and a crisis that nearly destroyed Australia agricultural heartland completely. The whole disaster started because Britain wanted to compete in the red dye market, and not just any red, the brightest red dye in the world, produced by crushing cochineal insects that lived on prickly pear cactus. During the colonial period, this dye was Mexico's second most valuable export after silver. That's how profitable it was. Red was power. Kings wore red robes. Cardinals wore red robes. British soldiers marched across continents in their famous red coats, all colored with crushed cochineal insects from prickly pear plants. So in 1788, Captain Arthur Phillips ships arrived in Australia carrying prickly pear plants infested with cochineal insects from Brazil. Joseph Banks had suggested establishing a dye industry in the new colony. It seemed like a solid economic plan, take control of a lucrative market that Spain had monopolized for centuries. The problem? The cochineal insects died almost immediately in Australia's climate. The prickly pear plants, however, they loved it. For decades, they stayed confined to coastal New South Wales, and settlers actually thought they were useful. People planted them as garden ornaments, used them as natural hedges around properties, and during droughts, farmers would feed the fleshy pads to livestock as emergency fodder. By the mid-1800s, new varieties of prickly pear started spreading across Queensland and New South Wales. Settlers moving inland brought cuttings with them. The dry interior climate west of the Great Dividing Range turned out to be a perfect habitat. Two species in particular, the common pest pear and the spiny pest pear, started multiplying at rates nobody expected. By 1870, it was completely out of control. The Sydney Mail published this description in 1923. The spread of prickly pear is like the invasion of a dangerous enemy, advancing slowly but steadily and gradually taking possession of our continent. The numbers were absolutely staggering. By 1919, prickly pear occupied 22 million acres. Scientists calculated it was spreading at 1 million acres per year. Farmers watched helplessly as their properties became worthless. Livestock would starve in paddocks that were completely surrounded by walls of spines they couldn't get through. Land that families had spent years clearing and cultivating just disappeared under green walls of cactus. And every solution only made it worse. 
the New South Wales government passed the Prickly Pear Destruction Act in 1886, making property owners legally responsible for destroying the cactus on their land. Government inspectors traveled across rural areas, documenting infestations and issuing orders. The law made sense on paper. In reality, it was asking people to do something that was physically impossible. Farmers tried burning it. They'd set massive fires that consumed all the surface growth, but the cactus would just regrow from underground roots. They tried digging up entire colonies, backbreaking work that took days, and destroyed the land in the process. But here's the problem. Any tiny pad fragment left behind in the soil would sprout and create new plants, kind of like zombie plants. Some farmers invested significant money in horse-drawn rollers designed to crush the cactus into pulp. This actually made things worse because the crushed pieces would take root wherever they landed, spreading the infestation even further. The government kept tightening the screws, updating the rules in 1901 and again in 1924, each time piling on stricter requirements and bigger penalties. The prickly pear didn't care about legislation. It kept advancing. Queensland offered a 5,000 pound reward in 1901 for anyone who could develop an effective destruction method. That's over 1 million Australian dollars today. Nobody could claim it. In 1907, they doubled the reward to 10,000 pounds, more than 2 million in modern currency. Inventors and entrepreneurs flooded the government with proposals. None of them worked, so they turned to chemical warfare. The 1926 Queensland Prickly Pear Land Commission reported that farmers had purchased over 31,000 tins of arsenic pentoxide and 27,950 tins of something called Robert's Improved Pear Poison. This stuff was 80% sulfuric acid mixed with 20% arsenic pentoxide. Farmers would spend months spraying this toxic mixture across their properties. The work was exhausting, expensive, and genuinely dangerous to human health. The poison would kill some plants, but new colonies appeared faster than anyone could treat them, so now you had contaminated soil and water sources, creating additional environmental problems on top of the cactus invasion. Then, in 1913, Queensland sent a team of biologists on a research trip across North and South America to study prickly pear in places where it naturally grew. What they discovered changed everything. In countries like Argentina and Mexico, prickly pear didn't take over. It just existed as one plant among many. The reason? Natural predators. The cactus had plenty of natural enemies, bugs and fungi that had evolved with it for thousands of years, so its numbers never got out of hand. The team came back with a radical recommendation. Introduce these natural enemies to Australia. It was called biological control, fighting nature with nature instead of fighting it with tools, chemicals, and mechanical equipment. But then World War I started in August 1914, and the entire project got shelved. Resources went to the war effort, and the prickly pear kept spreading unchecked for another six years. But get this, in 1920, the Commonwealth government finally joined forces with Queensland and New South Wales to create the Commonwealth Prickly Pear Board. They made a board for the pear. This organization had one very simple mission, stop the cactus invasion before it destroyed the entire eastern interior of Australia. They immediately immediately sent entomologists led by Alan P. Dodd back to America to collect the biological agents that had been identified years earlier. The scientists brought back more than 30 different species of insects and plant diseases for testing. Research stations were established, where each potential weapon went under strict evaluation. The challenge was finding something that would aggressively attack prickly pear without touching agricultural crops or native plants. Get this wrong, and you could create a problem even worse than the cactus. No pressure. The Cactoblastis cactorum moth from Argentina emerged as the best option. The life cycle was fascinating. Female moths would lay eggs in distinctive patterns on cactus pads. When the larvae hatched, they'd work as teams, breaking through the tough outer layer to reach the nutritious tissue inside. The caterpillars would devour the interior, growing rapidly. In just a few weeks, a colony of larvae could turn a healthy prickly pear plant into a rotting shell. But the first two breeding attempts failed miserably. The moths died before producing viable offspring. The pressure was enormous. Every single day the research took, another chunk of Australia disappeared under cactus. Scientists finally imported 3,000 Cactoblastis cactorum eggs from Argentina, splitting them between facilities in Chinchilla and Brisbane. 
these eggs were treated like they were made of gold. Researchers monitored them constantly, adjusting temperature and humidity, making sure conditions stayed perfect. Five-star treatment for these little guys. At Chinchilla, they ran meticulous tests. They offered the caterpillars dozens of different plant species, watching carefully to see if the moths would attack anything besides prickly pear. The moths ignored everything except the cactus. They were specialists that had evolved over thousands of years to eat only Opuntia species and nothing else. The breeding program turned out to be spectacularly successful. From an initial population of just 527 female moths, scientists harvested 100,605 eggs. The second generation produced over 2.5 million eggs. The moths were ready. In 1926, scientists made the call. They released the first Cactoblastis cactorum moths into the Australian environment, betting everything on this unprecedented biological control experiment. Soon, the impossible would become reality. The transformation happened faster than even the optimistic scientists predicted. The moths reproduced at rates that made the cactus spread look slow. Each generation of caterpillars would destroy entire fields of prickly pear. Then the adult moths would lay millions more eggs creating the next wave of destruction. These things were breeding like tiny, spiky bunnies on overdrive. It was like watching an invasion play out in reverse. Farmers started seeing results within months. Entire fields of dense prickly pear that had been impenetrable walls just collapsed. The thick barriers that had made properties completely unusable disappeared. Land that families had abandoned years earlier suddenly became accessible again. The experiment worked beyond anyone's wildest expectations. 60 million acres of land were restored to productivity without using a single drop of chemical poison or setting a single fire. The moths accomplished what mechanical equipment, toxic chemicals, and desperate proposals for military hardware could never achieve. The economic impact was massive. Communities that were facing complete extinction started rebuilding. Property values went from zero to profitable as the land became usable for farming and grazing again. The agricultural crisis that had threatened to permanently alter Australia's interior was just over. The gratitude people felt was so intense that in 1936, the community of Bunarga built the Cactoblastis Memorial Hall, Yip, an entire building dedicated to celebrating a moth. In 1965, the Queensland Women's Historical Association took it even further, erecting a stone cairn in Dalby with a plaque that recorded the indebtedness of the people of Queensland, and Dalby in particular, to the Cactoblastis Cactorum and their gratitude for deliverance from that scourge. Australia had monuments to war heroes, explorers, and politicians. Now they had a monument to an insect. But here's where the story takes a dark turn. In 1957, someone had the bright idea to introduce Cactoblastis cactorum moths to Caribbean islands that were dealing with invasive prickly pear. The moths were indigenous to South America, which meant Caribbean prickly pear populations had never encountered them before. They had zero natural defenses. The insects attacked native cactus species with exactly the same efficiency they'd shown in Australia. Then the moth spread from the Caribbean to Mexico, where they discovered something new to eat, commercial Opuntia crops. Mexican farmers had cultivated prickly pear for centuries. They harvested the fruit, ate the pads as vegetables, and used the plants for multiple economic purposes. The moths devastated these operations, destroying plants that fed entire communities and supported local economies. The United States started panicking. Important prickly pear species were popping up all over the southern states, causing problems both for the environment and for local farmers. Scientists worried the moths could spread across the entire region, destroying native ecosystems and commercial crops. Australia's miracle solution had turned into an invasive pest that threatened an entire continent. The irony is brutal. Australia solved its crisis by importing a natural enemy from South America. By doing it, it helped spread the enemy to places where it threatened native species that had existed for thousands of years. The moths showed both the incredible power and the serious danger of biological control. One region's environmental salvation became another region's agricultural nightmare. 
Modern ecologists see the prickly pear story as both a huge win and a warning. Biological control can work wonders, but sometimes it can also go spectacularly wrong. What other desperate measures from history succeeded way beyond anyone's expectations? And when facing environmental crises today, how do we balance the urgent need for bold action against the very real risk of creating unintended consequences that might be even worse than the original problem? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.